So uh, the title of my talk is Improving Learning in Clinical Medicine Using Wearable Sensor Technology. And we look at ourselves as a group of researchers who provide digital representations of hands-on performance. So this is very much about touch in healthcare. And I think it still surprises a number of people given all the technology that we have in the hospital uh, that we actually still touch our patients. Um, I'm covering trauma today and believe me, it is more efficient for me to observe and touch and feel and ask questions than to send my patient a CT scanner for everything that I think might be a problem. Um, in fact, touch helps us guide which CT scan we should get or x-ray. Um, and I think stepping back, it's not only physical exam, um, but we use our hands in the operating room to touch organs directly and indirectly. Sorry for the gray picture. If there's any surgeons in the audience who are looking at this, you're like, oh my goodness, that catheter went straight through the colon and you're having all these thoughts, you know, but we use our hands in the, in the operating room. And a lot of people talk about robotic surgery. You can't do robotic surgery without using your hands. So it's very much a, 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 a fluid relationship between the surgeon and the robot, even in that high tech combination. The fun thing about it is that there actually really is a science of touch. And two researchers um, from Carnegie Mellon uh, and uh, Queen's University partnered together, and they've really done some of the groundbreaking work with respect to touch. And uh, in addition to all of their hundreds of papers that they've written over the past 30 years in, in high impact journals, this is one of their most notable uh, contributions to haptics, the science of touch. They really unfolded what it is that we do when we are gathering information with our hands. Think about it. From physicians to athletes to truck drivers to typing to feeding yourself, they study infants through elderly, senior persons. They use blindfolds, no blindfolds. And it turns out that in any given situation, when you're trying to gather information with your hands or operate machinery or tools, the human computer interface, all of the above, you are making consciously and unconsciously one of these six maneuvers combined together. And this really helped us to understand um, our data as we embarked on quantifying and digitizing uh, touch. It's been exciting for us is to combine these two worlds, haptics and metrics. And our goal really is to quantify the learning curve to mastery, use that as criterion and really just a language of information exchange. These are some of the sensors we've explored over the past 15 years. Uh, many of you may recognize some of these FSR, force sensing resistors, motion uh, sensors, um, a variety of sensors uh, in collaboration with our engineering and uh, colleagues. And within healthcare, what we've done is take some of the simulated clinical scenarios, in this case, a clinical breast exam, Sometimes we buy the models off the shelf. Sometimes we reverse engineer and fabricate them ourselves and we place a variety of different types of sensors. This is one of the paper thin uh, sensor wafers. It's actually one of the larger ones um, and I'll show you a few others, but we combine them uh, with the computer interface. And this is what a clinical breast exam looks like in terms of the amount of pressure or force applied over time and within each of the different quadrants of the breast, each of the different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. And this is not in our current textbooks, but it actually, as I'll show you, turns out to actually be really important when you're teaching someone how to do a proper breast exam. This is one of our other sensors here. Instead of using a, a, a larger paper thin wafer for the breast exam, we were able to use a, a sensor matrix, if you will, um, where the actual sensors are much smaller than the human fingertips, so we weren't missing any data. And you can see the data instead of being projected in terms of um, a line graph of force over time, you can actually see a heat map of the exam. And what you're looking at here is the sensor map on the left side here, and then two family practitioners with 20 years experience doing an exam on a simulated patient that has a two centimeter 
breast mass near the chest wall. On the video, you can see there's some differences in their technique, but human beings visually aren't able to quantify force. And it turns out that force does matter. Turns out both of these clinicians, you can see it, are pressing the mass against the chest wall. And at times you see it light up here. One person said there was no mass because they actually didn't apply enough pressure to discern there was a mass. They touched it several times because we could see them touching it. Um, and the other person uh, noted that there was a mass. We ended up doing a study um, with over 550 practicing clinicians uh, around the country in different specialties, surgery, OBGYN, and family practice. And in that study, um, we used four different clinical scenarios, two of them with different chest wall lesions, one that was really rock hard and another one that was kind of rubbery. And it turns out that there is a linear relationship between force and accuracy. Um, there's a sweet spot of around five to 10 newtons. Beyond 10 newtons, um, increasing force does not give you an increase in accuracy. But it does turn out that about 15% of practicing clinicians don't apply enough force to do a breast exam. What was more interesting, uh, and I'll show you the other, this one, not only does force matter, but what you do with your fingertips matters. And um, you can see they're all using a different technique in terms of how they cover the breast, but they're also doing different techniques with their fingers. And it turns out if you use the piano fingers technique, then you're four times less likely to find the lesion when you're searching the breast. I will pause there because what we, are, what we learned is this is really an issue of information exchange. Many of the physicians perfected what they were taught in terms of how to do the exam, but we had never studied the exam in terms of accuracy and efficiency and compared them using technology. So many of these people spent 20 years perfecting an inaccurate or inefficient uh, technique. And we've repeated this with a number of different uh, medical procedures this one is with intubation. We put sensors on a mannequin in a number of different places. Uh, intubation is where you place a tube into the airway and you um, use a breathing machine to breathe for someone, either because they have lost their ability to breathe or we have actually put them under general anesthesia and paralyzed them so they can't breathe and we have to breathe for them. Um, we also put sensors where we don't want the tube to go, which is in the esophagus, which then if you pump air that goes to your stomach and that's not uh, a good situation. This is an intubation with the, in terms of the amount of force over time. Uh, the different colors represent the different um, areas of the anatomy and the airway. And by all purposes, um, this is a successful intubation, as you can see, where the breathing tube passes the vocal cords. Um, here, this shows the amount of force of the laryngoscope, that tube um, with the light source that helps you see in the airway. And you can tell this person, you know, did a number of manipulations looking uh, to see, get a good view of the airway before passing the tube. Um, this is successful, but this is what an experienced intubation looks like. Think about our scenario in healthcare, and I'll show you one example be before I um, really make some of my finishing points. The gold standard is to give verbal feedback. We train by human observation and we give verbal feedback, and we take those who are the best physicians in terms of their outcomes, and the students spend a lot of time with us hoping that, you know, with our feedback and our observation that our skills will rub off on them and they will make good decisions. It turns out that obviously if force uh, matters and human beings are good with observing force, some, a few tips and tricks and pearls get lost in translation. Um, and so there, there is a huge opportunity um, for technology to, to contribute um, to the teaching excellence that already exists in healthcare. Similar with the thyroid exam, and I'll show you this example only to show that what we're learning along the way is that every medical procedure has a force profile signature. Uh, looks like a bunch of squiggly lines here in terms of an intubation, but the two sensors, um, here is the one on the laryngoscope and here is the one on the vocal cords. Um, there's this pattern when you have good control of the airway. This person didn't have good control. They were still manipulating and then forced the tube in. Here, for a thyroid exam, looks very different. 
Um, force over time, same thing, the different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. But the thyroid exam here, this first part, the practitioner is putting their fingers on your neck to find the anatomy. And then once they're there, then they pr apply more pressure first to, you know, and people do left or right first, but this person applied more pressure on the left side and they ask you to swallow. And then they're able to feel the movement of the anatomy in that place and see if there's any tumors or anything overlying the, the mobile parts. And then they relax on that side and then press harder on the other side. There is a signature. And this is just amazing for us. This is, this is uh, new findings for us in healthcare. It's encouraged us. We are now exploring a wider variety of sensors. In one study, we did audio capture, video capture, EEG sensors, and motion tracking, different than force movement um, sensors, and these are all synchronized data streams. And this has really helped us um, understand not only the technical aspects, but how people talk, how they do teamwork, how they guide their team, how they teach, um, and cognitive load with, with EEG capture. So we are learning a lot um, about this in terms of the learning curve to mastery um, there is a lot of decisions that are made. There is a visual haptic loop. What we do in an operation in terms of cutting and moving organs around, we may have a plan from A through Z, but when the anatomy changes, we do have to have a plan B and C in terms of a different um, decisions uh, as we progress through our procedure. And so there are a lot of decisions that are made before action takes place. And this technology, combining haptics um, with sensor technology, whether it's motion tracking or force, gives us a new language. And we're able to move beyond um, just listening and observing humans, but also adding this layer of data. And again, I just want to underscore, we're dealing with adult learners and they're surgeons and, you know, well-trained and they are, they're very... Um, you know, proud of what they've learned thus far. And so sometimes teaching them, you have to get them, uh, situate them at a point of learning. And sometimes verbal, verbally, um, maybe missing a few of those details. This is an example of someone who, I, we say novice not tying motion, but this is someone who's uh, gone through 15 years of medical training and they're now learning how to do microscopic surgery. And to give them feedback of the consequences of something simple, not cutting their sutures short enough when they're tying, I can verbally give them a lecture of how this affects their efficiency and their working volume, but to show them the picture, the difference between their not tying and an expert, now they actually have a visual towards what they can work, a visual um, criteria and performance what they can work towards. Um, I think that a lot of people say, well, you know, this is great and fabulous research, but do doctors really want to be tested? For the past 20 years, it doesn't matter what conference we go to, what procedure we're simulating, they line up by the hundreds. People want the information. They come here on the first day of the conference. They let us put sensors on them, their tools, the mannequin. They do the procedures. We collect the data. They come back the next day and they have the, the, the qualitative research around the conversation that these people are having here is something we never experienced in the hospital without this technology. And that's what's really exciting. Um, we are still in the beginning phases of translating this work from a simulated environment to the hospital environment. Uh, but I say that uh, people are very excited. There is a, a, a um, group of early adopters um, a significant portion of, of physicians uh, that understand the utility of this, not only for their own clinical practice, but for teaching and training and setting the bar at a much higher level and shortening the learning curve. So what we're really after is everyday use of this technology to improve information exchange and learning. And uh, we're very excited with the opportunities that we've had to partner um, with national organizations um, and uh, that guide uh, medicine and, and are the rule makers in terms of credentialing um, and assessment. And uh, we're having lots of fun uh, with this type of work. So thank you very much.